Several months ago, you see this tweet that I'm highlighting here by Experimental Philosophy about a change in a graduate philosophy program. And this kicked off a lot of discussion in philosophy Twitter that I've been wanting to go back to for a while because I think this conversation is quite valuable and there's a lot that people might be able to learn from looking at what people had to say and the responses to each other. So let, let's just look at the quote right off the bat. Yale philosophy has officially replaced the grad program logic requirement with a broader formal methods requirement. Students can choose which course to take, logic, probability, stats, game theory, etc. Feels like a symptom of a much larger change in the discipline. And there's a lot to be said here. Is this indeed a much larger change in the discipline? It, does it matter that it's Yale? Uh, what is a logic class supposed to do for you in graduate school? These are all important issues that we'll get into shortly. But I think it's very important first to add a little bit of perspective that might be missing to a lot of people. So if we look at this one, we see Christopher Zorn saying, I don't know enough about philosophy at one small school in the Northeast to say whether this is good in context, but the general idea of broadening disciplinary requirements at the graduate level strikes me as ge a generally positive thing. And then here's another uh, perspective adding a set of reflections by Hobbes Goblin. My super hot take is that unless you're a graduate student at Yale or a prospective graduate student at Yale, Yale's change to their logic requirement is actually not very interesting. Why? USC changed a similar requirement like 16 years ago, but I, who was a grad student there at the time, could not remember whether it was the logic or language requirement that got switched to research methods. And this brings up a very important point. People get worked up about, ooh, an Ivy League school is changing something. That affects almost Nobody, and this is in a philosophy program, which, yes, there are quite a few graduate students in it, and others will go through it, but in the grand scheme of things, one school changing a few things in this way doesn't really affect the rest of us, even if we are in graduate school elsewhere, which is definitely not the case for me. And then we get some good, reasonable takes as well that I think are worth Looking at Kevin Zolman, I think this is broadly a good development. I like logic, and I think it's great for people to take it. But for many philosophers, if they're going to take one mathematical or formal class, logic is far from the best one. Erzat's doctor, I don't think this is such a bad thing. Some are making it out to be. Basic logic is a required skill in philosophy. But for most people, the more advanced formal stuff isn't that helpful. Better to give them formal training in areas that might be more relevant to their areas. Elizabeth uh, Picuto says... I wasn't a philosophy major, so I was behind the other grad students initially. A policy of read something when you actually need to know it for what you're doing served me well, but I'm really glad I took the formal logic that was required. Um, Ryan Muldoon says, I forget if we've done this officially or not, but we've been moving to this approach as well. Students should get trained in the formal methods that make the most sense for their work. Chemtrup says, seems like a really positive change. It pushes students a bit to study formal areas that might be more relevant to their work than formal logic. For example, a metaphysics student studying theoretical physics, social political philosophy student studying stats to understand empirical matters. Uh, then Brian Robertson, welcome news. Learning logic was great, but having to teach myself stats sucked. And so he's referencing there the fact that the kind of work that he did entailed learning prob and stats, probability and statistics. And instead of being able to do that in the department, he basically had to do that on his own. So those are all some good takes, I'd say. And then we got this interesting sub-conversation. Uh, Florence, who often says quite controversial things on Twitter, says, this is so sad. It's honestly a really worrying trend happening right now that philosophy PhDs keep lowering the bar on their requirements. And, you know, I actually will fess up to the fact that 
you know, if you'd looked at me 30 years ago, I probably would be saying the same stuff as Florence is here. And so Florence says, if anything, sh things should be more difficult in this respect. The people who don't need such a requirement will find it easy. It's, if it's difficult, that's all the more reason one needs to do it. It's sort of like the sink or swim, or we all have to be tough in philosophy. And then Caleb Ward said, Seems like formal methods are formal. Learning a different formal method isn't necessarily lowering the bar, right? Or maybe this was sarcasm, in which case, please ignore it. And then Florence responds, you're definitely right that for this reason, this change is way less objectionable than a lot of requirements that have been dropped or made more lax. But I do worry that a lot of formal methods classes, such as statistics, which was mentioned, don't train for the same skills. And now that is a reasonable worry, but... As it turns out, maybe some of the same skills are being fostered. We'll see that discussed later on. Then we get a very interesting close to this. Sarah says, this has already been said, but I don't really think this involves any lowering of bars. It's just a way of ensuring that this particular bar continues to assess the relevant kinds of formal training. And then Florence says, yes, I do now worry I've projected some general feelings onto a particular case. And then Sarah says, surely what any true philosopher would do. And so this is kind of good to observe, isn't it? A philosopher saying, you know, I might have overreacted to this. I'll have to think about it more. Uh, and then we have a great clarificatory conversation that was spurred by Harvey Letterman, who says, I'm in favor of having a single course that all grads take, which covers basic topics from all relevant formal areas, probability, modal logic, semantics, decision theory. The old model of a strict logic requirement is not relevant to most research, but I think we benefit as a profession from having a shared language. Everyone can be expected to know the free for all, go learn whatever methods you need. Model does not achieve this. There should also independently be more scaffolding and rewards for students to get intermediate training in the formal areas most relevant to them. For example, machine learning or psychology, a shared set of tools as given by a basic class are part of what makes the discipline coherent. I think that's a real value, though what is covered in the basic class should be updated regularly. So this would be a pretty radical uh, reworking of things. And Matt Teichman, I think this comment is entirely on point. This kind of feels like the philosophy version of discrete math, which is often the only pure math class a CS student, computer science, is required to take, and which represents quite the smorgasbord of topics. Now, if you don't know what a smorgasbord is, it's a buffet, and there's lots and lots of stuff laid out. You just grab whatever it is that you want. This is entirely correct. I can say, as somebody who, who took discrete math as a mathematics major, it is just a bunch of stuff kind of thrown together, and it's a really fun class, but it's not giving you any sort of like coherent introduction to all of these very interesting topics, and it tends to be one week we're doing this, the next week we're doing this. So um, continuing on with this, there's a discussion between Brad Scow and Harvey Letterman. Scow says the rationale for a logic requirement is that all philosophers will at some point have to evaluate an argument that doesn't extend to decision theory, probability, et cetera, requirement. Those are irrelevant to many parts of philosophy. Harvey Letterman says, well, that would motivate a propositional logic class, but most of the actual implementations of a logic requirement go into meta theory and incompleteness, much fancier than what's used in actual philosophy. Are you thinking modal and conditional logic is generally needed as well? In any case, I think probability is extremely widely used these days in lots of areas, so I'm not sure it's restricted as this comment suggested. And then Brad Scow says, I think there's large parts of value theory where one could make great contributions with no knowledge of probability theory. True, but largely irrelevant. And Harvey Letterman says, sure, but I think there's large parts of philosophy where one could make great contributions with no knowledge other than modus ponens and modus tollens. Still, we teach more than that. So a lot to think about with this conversation about the pedagogy that we're 
providing in graduate programs in logic. Then we see some important concerns expressed over gatekeeping, and this indeed is a real issue. Cam says, I don't have an opinion about curriculum at unis I think shouldn't exist like Yale, but I'm seeing people celebrate this because logic requirements get gate kept good philosophers from getting degrees. And that seems odd to me. It's a style of thinking that's hard, not logic, the specific subject. We also see uh, Christina Easton saying, I knew someone during my PhD who eventually got kicked off as they kept failing the logic requirement. I think the general consensus was that he was a good philosopher. And then experimental philosophy, the original poster says, well, that's horrible. As a discipline, we need to rec we need to do more to recognize there are different ways of being a good philosopher and that not all philosophers will look the same. Ghostly phenomenology says the requirements are almost always unnecessary barriers, though. They don't demonstrate any aptitude or anything. Something like a logic requirement for many philosophers will in no way help them to do their work. It's not lowering the bar, but recognizing it was a bad bar. Very important distinction being articulated there. Then we get sort of an add-on. This is a fantastic idea. Now do it for languages. There are very often language requirements for uh, philosophy graduate programs. And then experimental philosophy says something that I mean, basically is happening in many places. You mean that instead of everyone taking the same languages, German, ancient Greek, we should try to open things up so that there are more people studying classical Chinese or Arabic, like, for instance, they do at Marquette University uh, for Arabic because of the Aquinas and the Arabs project. Anyway, moving on, there are some worries about teaching philosophy. The logic requirement is supposed to prepare you for being a good teacher. Wesley Buckwalter says, I support the plurality, but here's one downside. When students get jobs teaching philosophy, logic is a course they are incredibly likely to have to teach. It just makes sense as job training. And then experimental philosophy responds, yes, it's very helpful in a number of respects to know the kind of logic that's typically covered in undergrad courses. Again, an important distinction, but a graduate course in logic typically covers other stuff like first order meta theory, completeness, compactness, Lewenheim, Skolem. And I would actually interject here that it's not the case that, you know, logic is a course that you are incredibly likely to have to teach. Uh, I would say ethics is actually much more likely. Or if there's going to be a logic class, it's probably more likely these days you're going to be teaching some logic in a critical thinking or informal logic class rather than the stuff that you're doing in a graduate level logic class. Peter Joseph says, as teaching philosophy, enjoying philosophy, and being a philosopher are all different things, I doubt that universities can know what exactly is needed to know in philosophy. As a philosophy student who hated symbolic logic, I would have never have submitted to that requirement. And this is, in the first part, entirely dead on. These graduate programs typically don't know very much about exactly what sort of situations their graduates are going to be in or what the they, let alone what's going to be you know a part of the curriculum 10 years from now or anything like that they're they're kind of engaging in enlightened guesswork then we get some silly takes some not quite so well thought out takes the athenian stranger who is an alt-right account chances are it can ultimately be traced to its decision made according to diversity equity initiatives 100 percent you know this is kind of dogmatic assertion and uh, experimental philosophy says yeah that's not the case uh kevin Karam. Uh, philosophy requires that one love wisdom. You can't love wisdom if everything is just a socially constructed tool. No relationship with something other than yourself. No love, no love, no philosophy. It's kind of hard to figure out what point he's making there. It seems more of a rant than an on-topic contribution. But I, you know, I just wanted to give you that. And here's another one that's equally so. This is from Eric Purchase. It's a sign that philosophy is melting into the technocracy. 
Now, that one I don't get. Uh, you know, the removal of the logic requirement or the shifting it to prob and stats is philosophy melting into technocracy. I, I, don't, I don't get it. I mean, this seems more like somebody just throwing around words. Uh, objectively correct, I think coming uh, likely from the left, says, can't believe the ruling class institution is continuing its quest to bar rationality, teleolo teleology, and logic from being accessed by the filthy masses. Luckily, millions of warehouse workers and petty weed dealers are reading Hegel and discussing on secret means-tested social media. Well, I mean, I can tell you that uh, discussing Hegel is not a substitute for formal logic and that I would guess that most of the people out there discussing Hegel don't actually understand Hegel that well. So I'm not sure what that's got to do with anything. Finally, Sac uh, Sacra Chemis. Good, that class is useless. Turning what is mostly obvious into something not obvious as well and not useful for anything. People don't reason that way, and reason is a slave to our biases anyhow. And, you know, you read stuff like that and you're like, well, okay, you might have had a point, but you kind of wrecked it on the way in how you were uh, articulating it. And so these are all, I'll just put, say, silly takes, right? They, they don't have much of a, a solid basis. Then we have another set of takes that kind of get logic wrong. What is the function of logic? How does it work? How is it connected to other things? So PAC Delery says, proficiency in formal logic should be a requirement for every degree, as it was in medieval universities. And you could say, well, you know... Um, that's not quite the case. And why the hell would we want to model what we're doing after medieval universities unless we're hankerers after some ideal medieval age, right? Annoyed Cat says that will provide literacy problems for grad students. Without logic, much of philosophy will not be comprehensible. That is totally wrong. I mean, you don't need formal logic to make sense out of most philosophy that you're going to read. I mean, if that was indeed the case, then you couldn't have read Plato back in the day <laughs> because there wasn't formal logic classes, right? Uh, Laurie Casserly, this is like stripping the solid math space from physics and slipping in some trashy watered down shit. Well, no, it's not that good of an analogy there. Philosophy is not physics. This is not removing mathematics or anything quite so uh, advanced. Um, and then we get, a, you know, uh, this uh, Mestita Gringa saying something about letting philosophers get away with stats as their formal method seems very counter to the discipline of philosophy. And this strikes me as something that somebody who hasn't really taken a rigorous stats class would say. Uh, I, I mean, I've taken formal logic. I used to specialize in that. I also did a lot of work in probability and statistics. And I can tell you that uh, it can get pretty complex and rigorous. Finally, uh, quack, quack. Basically, statistics are built off logic. So one is more foundational than the other, and philosophy seems to be a field that should care about foundations. Also, most stats classes are garbage and do little more than teach p-values. you got to say, well, where are you getting this from? Uh, are you an expert that has, like, surveyed stat classes across the more than 2,000 universities and colleges we have here in the United States? Or are you just blathering? So Adam Leeds uh, weighs in, I'm not familiar with the logicist reduction of statistics. Can you give me a reference? And here's, here's an example of a terrible argument, right? Quack, quack. Statistics comes from math. Math comes from logic. You might as well say, well, I guess you don't understand any of that. So Adam Leeds says, well, you might find it interesting to learn about the failure of the logicist research program in the early 20th century, which is quite relevant. And Quack Quack says, I'm familiar. Math is still based on logic, even if the axioms themselves can't be proven and must be found in some other way. And if you actually know uh, mathematics, you know, the various uh, things that fall into that discipline, if you worked in that field and you know logic, you know that, yes, in some sense, mathematics could be said to be based on logic, but you sure as hell don't need logic or a graduate level logic class in order to do mathematics. So 
you know, once again, some bad takes. And here's some sort of remedies to that. So the, these are some good points about logic and other disciplines. Mary Beth Willard says, I suspect this is probably fine. It was always a little suspicious that everyone needed first order meta theory. I can't imagine a philosopher versed in game theory isn't going to be competent in logic anyway. And then Diego uh, Gorini says, I struggle to see how one can study either probability or game theory without a basic understanding of logic. The principles of formal problem solving are logical by contradiction. Um, and then Rod and Crawley says, I don't know about et cetera, is that a term a logician would use, but probability, stats, game theory, all would lead to an examination of logic eventually if it wasn't necessary before studying them. So you're kind of, you know, if you put these together, I interpret this as saying, listen, you're going to get your logic stuff along the way. You don't actually need a class just specifically on that. Um, if you're studying these other disciplines, you're going to get into it. And then continuing on with this, like before Thibault, and I agree with, with this, as a math guy, I've always thought probability would be more useful for philosophy majors than classical logic. Um, I definitely agree with that, especially in a culture in which innumeracy is such a major problem. David Kinney says, uh, in my opinion, a good stats or probability class is of greater benefit to someone hoping to do research in, for example, epistemology than would be modal logic or set theory. But I think a good stats or probability class should start with some set theory. You need to know what an algebra is. Eh, quite true. And you're going to get that if you take a good stats or probability class, most likely, right? Or you'll get it in the prereqs. Um, Elder says, this is very interesting and much needed, in my opinion. I started expanding the notion of formal methods in my own teaching of critical thinking. Glad to see that others are doing the same. And if you actually look at what critical thinking classes look like, or you look at uh, the various models of critical thinking out there that have been articulated for, you know, about three decades or so going back, um, you'll see that other methods are involved in that, right? Uh, Richard Lucas says game theory is a worthy addition to any philosopher's bag of tricks. Uh, the logic I see discussed in various philosophy essays falls short of the intellectual impact I see coming from prob stats and especially game theory applied in other humanities. Mitch uh, Hirschbach says my grad program requires two logic classes that covered propositional logic and predicate logic and modal logic. I'd have been much better served re replacing modal logic with prob and stats. And uh, frankly, as somebody who knows these, I would, I would tend to agree. Uh, modal logic is very fun and cool and useful for some things, but a prob and stats is just, you know, very helpful. Finally, Casey says, as someone who took advanced logic in undergrad and is now currently fulfilling my PhD logic requirement, a game theory or probability course would have probably been more useful at this point. So I don't know why people are mad at Yale for allowing this. Seems good to me. So we're getting, you know, some good weigh-ins from people who are stakeholders in this. Um, another thing that we need to think about is this aura that we surround logic classes with. We pretend or, you know, tell ourselves that, oh, this is going to like inculcate a certain mode of thinking, but we don't really know that now, do we? So Protsko says, just randomly assign students to take logic or one of the other courses and then measure outcomes years later. An experimental philosophy responds, if we decide this is the best method for answering our question, it fe almost feels like we thereby have already before us an answer to the question we are asking. So, you know, this would actually be a good experiment to do. Very difficult to pull off, of course. Uh, Goro Shimura says, one thing I'll say about this is I think I'd be more convinced by the people who insist that everyone should learn first order meta theory in particular if there were evidence that the people who basically have to be made to do so at gunpoint actually retain any value from it. Very important point there. Arbtus Tree says, I think if you study which logic or math more generally, 
um, the limitations of the discipline become obvious, especially in application to more nebulous things like philosophy. So true. Um, you know, it's, it's always funny to see the logic bros. And I saw this a lot when I was in graduate school, take philosophical arguments, shoehorn them into some logical notation, totally screw them up in the process and then play around with them and regurgitate something that doesn't look remotely like the argument that they started with. Finally, TL says, I have no strong opinion on the matter of this debate, but there is so much misunderstanding of what logic is about in this discussion. So the required logic courses aren't that successful whatsoever. You know, presumably all the people who are weighing in about how important logic is and how we can't leave it out, you know, um, should be demonstrating the positive effects of having taken logic classes. Otherwise, they don't know what the hell they're talking about and they're not qualified to weigh in. And unfortunately, they're saying boneheaded things, some of them. Here's a joke that I thought we have to put in here uh, from Yuval Ginbar. Fine about the proposal, as long as it works in all possible worlds. So we're talking about the possible world semantics that became quite popular, really from about the 1990s onward in analytic philosophy, which is also something that people should probably learn in a methods class, perhaps. Then finally, uh, experimental philosophy, the original poster, says something that I think is quite positive in all the discourse about it. One thing I find really striking is the folks who actually work in logic themselves keep speaking out against the idea that logic should be required. This shows a truly admirable openness and lack of imperialism. So that's a, a good discussion that I realize, um, you know, we're coming a little bit late to the game, but, you know, it's a sort of perennial topic and it doesn't just concern Yale. If it did, then I don't think most of us would care about it unless we take Yale as somehow being representative of philosophy, which it definitely isn't. But this is a great thing to think about. How do we train people in the discipline of philosophy? We could extend this to other disciplines as well. What's important stuff? What are the skills? What is the content? What are the uh, capacities, the mindsets that we need to be promoting and inculcating in graduate school? And do we have to do it one single way? So that's it for this one. And we'll pick up with plenty of other Twitter conversations happening about philosophy and related matters somewhere else down the line.